In our previous topics, we have discussed the importance of SI units and how uncertainty plays a role in measuring quantities. Now we will introduce the importance of scalar quantities and vector quantities. A scalar quantity is a quantity that has a magnitude and size, but does not have a direction. A few examples of these quantities are mass, time, and energy. Scientists use these scalar quantities to describe the world around them with precise values. Vector quantities are similar to scalar quantities, but there is one main difference between the two. Vector quantities are quantities that have a magnitude and direction. A few examples of vector quantities are velocity, force, and momentum. But to better understand the difference between vectors and scalar quantities, we should compare quantities that are used interchangeably in common language. Speed and velocities are two quantities that are used to describe similar phenomena in real life. However, in physics, speed and velocity are examples of the difference between scalar and vector quantities. Speed is a scalar quantity. This means that you can describe a car traveling to the left as having a speed of 15 meters per second. Or, if it's traveling to the right, it also has a speed of 15 meters per second. However, you cannot use the word velocity to describe those same cars. Since velocity is a vector quantity, we must report the direction the car is traveling in order to say it has a velocity. For example, the car traveling to the left has a velocity of 15 meters per second to the left. The speed is 15 meters per second, but when we add the direction of travel for the car, instead of speed, we are now describing the velocity of the car. This difference between speed and velocity will appear again in topic two. Since vector quantities have a direction, we must always take into consideration the direction of the quantity in our calculations. Physicists use the Cartesian coordinate system to help define directions in space. Up is positive, down is negative, to the right is positive, and to the left is negative. The positive or negative sign for these directions are important because when we describe an object with a speed of 15 meters per second moving to the left as a velocity, we can say that the object's velocity is actually negative 15 meters per second. Because left is in the negative direction, the value for the velocity is negative 15 meters per second. Even though the speed has not changed, the negative is there to indicate the direction of travel. One extremely important feature about vector quantities in physics is the ability to use them as models for different quantities like force, velocity, and acceleration. Arrows are used to represent vector quantities in physics, and with appropriate use of geometry and trigonometry, physicists are able to calculate unknown information from the quantities they do know. In order to use these arrows to represent quantities, we must know two important rules. One. The length of the arrow represents the magnitude of the quantity. This means a longer arrow represents a larger number. A common issue occurs when we compare vector quantities. For example, if we compared the velocity of negative 15 meters per second to the velocity of 5 meters per second and asked which car is moving faster, most people would say 5 meters per second is greater than negative 15 meters per second so the car going 5 meters per second is faster. However, we must remember that the negative sign is only representing a direction. So what we are really saying is, a car is traveling to the left at 15 meters per second, and a different car is traveling to the right at 5 meters per second. Therefore, the car traveling to the left is actually traveling faster. The vector arrows allow us to describe exactly that same situation with a visual representation of the information. Here we have the vector arrow representing the car going to the right, and because the car going to the left has a greater value, 15 meters per second, its arrow will be longer to show that it is moving faster but is in the opposite direction. That brings us to rule two, which is that the direction the arrow faces is the direction of the vector quantity. We have already seen this with our previous example. A car moving to the left should have a vector arrow pointing to the left to represent its motion, and a car moving to the right has an arrow pointing to the right. The same rules apply to all vector quantities. Mm -hmm.
last feature of vector arrows is the ability to use mathematics to calculate unknown values. To take advantage of this feature fully requires some knowledge of geometry and trigonometry, but for right now we will introduce the basics of adding and subtracting vectors as a model. To add vectors, we use a method called tip to tail. To use this method, you take two vector quantities and draw them so the tip of one vector touches the tail of the other vector. The goal is still to represent the angle, length, and direction of the two combined vectors. With those two vectors combined, you can create the resultant vector. This vector is the result of the addition of the two previous vectors and their combination. Take these two vectors into account, vector 1 and vector 2. If I were to add these two vectors, we can take the length, direction, and angle of vector 2 and draw it so that the tip of vector 1 meets with the tail of vector 2. The resultant vector is the vector that can be formed from the tail of vector 1 to the tip of vector 2. Subtraction can also be used with vectors, but a different method must be used to find the resultant vector. To subtract vectors, you must reverse the direction of one of the vectors, and then you can use the tip-to-tail method used previously in the addition of vectors. Let's look back at vectors 1 and 2. If we are subtracting vector 2 from vector 1, the only thing we do differently is to reverse the direction of vector 2 first. Keep the angle and the length the same, of course. And then what we'll do is we'll add the reversed vector 2 to the original vector 1. The resultant vector is different compared to when we added vectors. The last significant part about vectors is being familiar with right triangles and the Pythagorean theorem. Because we can combine vectors to get resultant vectors, when vectors are combined at right angles, we can produce right triangles. The importance of this feature is that with the Pythagorean theorem, which states that the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the two sides, we can solve for the length of the resultant vector. This can give physicists the ability to predict the outcomes of events given enough information. This ability to use mathematics, models, and quantities to predict and problem solve is the basis of theoretical physics and a practice done in all physics classes.